Brady. Hi, Dahi and Steven and everyone tuning in. Thank you both for joining me today on our conversation on Nakasek's new series, Why Asians Should Care. We're going to talk about the need for accessible, accurate, responsive, and inclusive education for all students that allow each student to succeed. Uh, my name is Ha. I go by she, her pronouns. I am the community organizer at Hamke Center. We're located in Virginia. Um, what we're currently doing in terms of education, um, we've been hearing um, from our community members about like them wanting to see, um, you know, themselves represented in their history. Um, this current thing that is happening now with us is that every seven years, our standard of learning um, by subject, um, it gets updated. So um, this current year, it's on history and social science. Um, and it's more than just a test that students take each year. Um, it's from kindergarten to 12th grade, um, but it's also a guideline for teachers to, um, you know, create their curriculum. Um, we want to, you know, be able to take part in this process with the Virginia Board of Education, have our community members take part of it, um, share what our AAPI experience um, and having that reflect, uh, reflected in the curriculum. Um, we believe that exposure to the values, perspective, and experiences of many communities promote empathy for all. Yeah. So comment below your, I'm kidding. So, <laughs> <laughs> hi, everyone. Um, my name is Dahi. I go by she, her pronouns. I am the youth organizer at the Mequon Center. We located in New York City and specifically in Flushing and... I'm from New York, so I'm crazy, but um, <coughs> so at the Minkwan Center, what do we do, man? We are currently working on, well, I guess to like preface all of this, like I am the youth organizer, but I interface, 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 yeah, interface, interface with all of our community members, like including like our senior volunteers, like regular, regular people, like all of those such things, but the youth program specifically is anyone under 24 years old. We have a few programs, but mostly our biggest youth program is the youth empowerment program, which is centralized around political education. And in addition to that, like more popular education. So like what's happening in this world, doing like different know your rights. We also have like basic sex ed where I pass a menstrual cup around and everyone touches the menstrual cup. But that's in terms of education wise. And then I think with education and specifically focusing on youth I think we really we I say we like there's a team it's just me so I well my students are the team so we really focus on eliminating the hierarchies that exist within educating k-12 through students or just the student slash teacher expert whatever dynamic and we really try to lead with a youth focused and youth oriented mentality and philosophy so it's essentially the purpose of education at Minkwan isn't necessarily to, you know, feed into capitalism or to like get ahead somehow, but it's more so we are more aware of ourselves, our neighbors, our, the wretched society that we live in, and essentially using that information to feel empowered to go through change. And just a little tidbit about New York City schools in general. So institutionalized schools in New York City are some of the most segregated public schools in the country. And we are also one of the last cities in which the, the mayor, the fun mayor is control over the schools. So that's just a little background on what Minkwan is up to. Thank you. Um, hey everyone, my name is Steven Wu. My pronouns are he and him. I'm the organizing and policy manager at Woody Funtos here in Houston, Texas. And we are still a relatively young organization. Our youth slash education work is still being built out, but we just hosted our first youth leadership program this summer, which was extremely exciting. We had six to eight like high school to college aged Asian students come through to learn more about their Asian American identity, especially here in the South and in Texas. And then more advocacy things that really connect with like, their own lived experiences and gun safety. Obviously, that's a huge thing for people in schools these days, sadly. Uh, abortion rights, obviously another big thing here down in Texas. 
and climate justice, since they are going to be the ones who are going to have to live through all the mistakes that our previous generations have been making. <laughs> and then finally, the last piece, they you know took all that information, brainstormed which brainstormed which areas they care about, and are uh, writing an op-ed about like why they want to make change for certain things. And one of them is uh, is about abortion rights, which will actually be published with this. Uh, youth-focused media outlet here in Houston called Shift Press. Shout out to Shift Press. Uh, they're going to publish it. So we're really stoked that like they went to our program, they learned cool things, and they're actually writing stuff about it that's going to hopefully make some change down here. And then the other couple of stuff that we're hoping to do more in is more related towards like policy. So the first is K-12 through Asian American studies in our schools, which is hella needed. It's desperately needed. We don't have as many like ethnic studies across the states. They only recently passed African-American studies and Mexican-American studies. And they're, we're fortunate that the State Board of Education has like accepted that like we can move on to the next stage for Asian-American as well as like indigenous studies, which is really cool. But there's still like a long process of getting it done. There's a pilot program that needs to be conducted, more like public hearings. So we're trying to mobilize our peers especially our students that come through and just show out of like why we really need this in the state of Texas. And then the last piece is more about like funding. Uh, there's huge debates about whether public money should be going to public schools or private and charter schools, which is where we don't want that to go. We don't want to deplete money that needs to be going towards public schools, which already are underfunded. And then even if the money gets there, we want to make sure it's not being used to like over-police our students so that they don't buy right shields or rifles or God forbid change school structures. So that's only one door to get in and out, which is ridiculous. So those are the couple of things that we're trying to work on. Man, every time I hear policing in schools, my blood boils. It's like, yeah. come on guys. Like ugh. it's so sad that people want to spend more money on militarized police than on public education. Like, just mm -hmm. right. stop that for a second. Like, <laughs> okay, so what we need is more funding for our yeah, teachers. Like, me, so you'd rather resources. Like, it doesn't make any sense. Like, in New York City, there was a 215 million budget cut this year because because people are silly. But then, do you, the NYPD police budget is like 5.88 billion, I think. And then DOE just faced like a $250 million budget cut. Like, it's just very strange. And I think in New York City specifically, like, I don't know about y'all, but like, there's this current policy that's been being really heavily advocated for called solutions, not suspensions, in which it is eliminating suspensions, um, calling for more social workers, for more guidance counselors, for more, what's the word, advisors, and just like, providing alternative solutions that don't have to do with policing students. And like in New York City, like policing isn't just about like having literal cops at the school. It's also like the metal detectors, like the random searches, like it's, it's just so aggressive and it's, it's so silly. Like the best, most polite word I could think of is silly. And it is silly. Wasn't like y'all's previous, one of y'all's previous mayors bragging about how big the police budget was like it's like the something fifth or sixth largest in the world as like a military budget I'm like why are you why are you so proud of that that doesn't surprise me I mean our current mayor right now Mr. Mr. Eric Adams who lives in New Jersey by the way and shouldn't be mayor um he was an ex-cop and so it's like woohoo we got a cop mayor now but like you know a long time ago like school security was done under DOE but then it got transferred over to the NYPD in like I think the 80s and it's like why <laughs> like that shit just makes me so mad and it's like it, if you really break it and it like contributes to like the school to prison pipeline and like you know of course the black and brown schools in New York City which again schools are really segregated here so we know what schools they are like of course they have more police they have more metal detectors like they have more like infractions being handed out like it's just so ridiculous and it like it really boils down to like you're willing to spend more money on like you're willing to spend more money on police hold on i have to say that again so you're willing to spend more money on like 
militarizing and like surveilling students than on their education. Like mm-hmm. something, if you really look at it down to there, some, there's something really wrong with that. Yeah. And then for like our students who are undocumented or not citizens, they have that extra layer of potentially getting caught up with ICE Boy. in the immigration system, right? So. Right. There's so many layers within this and like, uh, yeah, there's so much we can do, but like, yeah, the funding should go into resources for teachers and like schools itself, not for more policing. Like, it's so strange. Like, why? Like, I literally have students who like don't have AC, you know, fun fact, New York City schools, not all New York City schools had AC, not every classroom had an AC. And yet this really expensive, bougie, like basically millionaires row in New York City called Hudson Yards. The trees, because it's like basically just a bunch of trees and stuff and they put a platform over it. The trees needed AC. So those tree roots got air conditioning before every single classroom in New York City. Like, huh? Like trees- That's really silly. (laughs) Like K through 12 schools in New York City. That's so stupid. Like, what are we doing? Like, I think people like really don't, like people love to talk about, oh, education is like the great equalizer. Like everyone deserves education, education. And then yet you see the ways that the schools like allocate the money and allocate resources and the way they like systemically like continue to perpetuate like the class differences. It's just ridiculous. And it kind of pisses me off to be honest. No, so. for sure. It's it's white supremacy and capitalism at work. Thanks. <sighs> Terrible. I mean... I guess the first thing, like, I think it's like white supremacy and capitalism. And then you have all these conversations around like, like eliminating critical race theory, which is it allowed in, is it banned in your states? It, yeah. There's an executive <laughs> order. <laughs> what is it happened last year for us. What does the legislature like actually say if it's banned in your state? Because, like, you can't just ban, like, the framework of thought. Like, what did this say? I'm so curious. Yeah, so I think for us, like, the biggest thing the bill really did was it required teachers to provide a holistic view of past events. So, like, present both perspectives. And then, obviously, the argument against that was, like, why would we want to present the bad argument? the bad arguments of like the Holocaust or the genocide or slavery or anything else that the U S has like, uh. and, other things. and I'm just like, yeah. And, and, and then uh, the, the legislators who were pushing for it. were saying, no, you know, we just want to make sure that no, you know, specific race feels like they're being put down or uh, attacked. We want to make sure that we're creating like a healthy environment. I'm like, no, we're not. This is not a healthy environment. This is going to breed more terrible people in the future. It's terrifying. And also at the same time, like completely dehumanizing non-white students. Literally. I think a big thing, like going off, I read somewhere, who was it? Was talking about like how when we, and then when we're in a classroom, we're talking about race, immigration, and all of these things. It can't be, I think using the word safe space is misleading, to be mm-hmm. honest. I heard this somewhere where it's like, how can the classroom be safe when we're talking about like violence again? against your ancestors and against your community members. So it's like, it kind of like safe, like when they say safe place, like who do you want to make, like who do you want to make a safe classroom for? Like the white kids, like, cause you don't want them to feel like, like shit. But yeah, ha, huh? what about, what about your state? <laughs> it's not just like the critical race theories. There's um, also like a policy that they're talking about in terms of like um, sexually explicit content. I'm not sure if y'all state has that as well in terms of like books and reading materials for students. And this is mainly um, kind of geared towards like, you know, LGBTQ student uh, plus students and things like that. Um, those types of like stories are kind of like taken away now, um, more diverse stories, I guess, or I guess um, uh, authors of like different race, ethnicity, things like that. Um, yeah, um, kind of geared towards that as well. So yeah. That's where we're at. <laughs> fans, like gay stories. Yeah. Like, or like transgender stories, things like that. You know, maybe even like children's book. Um, I know like, yeah, uh, Alice Walker books, things like that in the past. That was something. Um, and then there's like, there's still an ongoing thing <laughs> in school district and the state itself. Yeah. So do y'all have like a banned book list right now in the state? 
Yeah, I'm pretty sure there is. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's just an extensive list. And then, like, parents commenting on things like that. Um, yeah. Yeah, we have one, too. And I think the latest one that, like, made news was, like, the band book list also includes to not have, like, Anne Frank. I'm like, what? Huh? What are we doing? <laughs> What is happening? <laughs> like, what is happening? I feel like, ugh, like, what? Like, who? Like, what? I think it's so sad because, like, when we look at schools, like, they directly, they correlate directly to what the climate is like in the country. And to see, like, like, yeah, people are just okay with banning, you know, teaching race and slavery. Like, it's so bizarre. And, like, I, like, it makes me wonder and it makes me think like about the everyday instances and like have we not learned like is is this I'm sorry I'm just so flabbergasted because I'm remembering <laughs> say gay bill in Florida too and like it's like a like how unsafe of a space school has become for so many of our community members like a lot of my immigrant students specifically would speak about going to school and like trying to almost deny their heritage because they mm. mean, like school makes me feel like shit about myself like I go to school and it's a place where I feel ashamed of my ethnic background or my like religious background or, like xyz whatever and like I think like school culture like because again edu like school right now like institutionalized education at least is not a place to like breed like as they call like innovators and future makers and you make the change you want to be like that's clearly not what you're promoting there all you're promoting is like to keep status quo to like make essentially the rich richer the poor poor the marginalized more marginalized and like I think it speaks volumes when you see who like wants to go to school and why and then who mm -hmm. doesn't want to go to school and why mm -hmm. and it's just like people should be more mad about this in my opinion I think people should care way more about school <laughs> You're spinning and, facts. You're spinning facts. Yeah. And I think the students do care. Like you can see them like pushing back against these legislations and things like that, speaking up, joining together, doing things such as like, you know, um, walkouts, like during the um, Rob Elementary School shooting, like after that, like I know even schools throughout the our state of Virginia, students participated in that um and climate change and um there's something regarding like transgender students and bathrooms here in virginia students are rallying around that those legislations as well so no like they're a powerful crew and they organize so it's cool like working with them and like seeing like you know what they want to do and what changes they want to see as well that is so cool um and yeah i i, I wanted to like talk a little bit more about like you know what has been has been being what is being done with y'all states and, and work that is bringing positive like change for education and when ha you mentioned like students like doing um uh, basically like, strikes at school and then going to public hearings like i remember when we mobilized like a good amount of like young folks in houston drove to austin for the state board of education hearing to talk about asian american studies it was like 5 a.m. waking up, people meeting at a central location to get on a bus. And these are, of course, like high school students, maybe like like early college students. Like I, I would not get up that early when I was that young. <laughs> <laughs> so for them, to do that, okay, it safe. showed how much like it mattered to them. And then, of course, when they get there and it was their time to speak in front of the board, they just like went all out and, and people just calling out the complete bullshit that they were committing. And I was like, heck, yes, this is magical i think people need to stop underestimating our young people like right <laughs> not believe like i had a 14 year old student like go to pride because our we went to pride for the first time this year and i had a 14 year old non-binary student and they had a sign that said my mom doesn't know i'm here and like it's just like the students like they re they have a voice and they have their experiences and like it's in like students are kept out of so many conversations about education and it's like why don't we give the students some autonomy some agency and like what they're learning how they're learning it and I just think even now like conversations around education should involve students and should involve young people like they're hella scary man like they will especially at Minkwan like I definitely strive to foster like independent thinkers who like lead with empathy and it's like 
they will have no problem calling you out on your bullshit like at all and it's like they're not being rude about it they'll literally just be like um actually that is enforcing white supremacist colonial thought and i am not gonna have it patriarchy here is disgusting and like you know this actually brings up something that i realized I remember when Roe v. Wade got overturned and we were all upset and I talked to my students like how many of you learned about Roe v. Wade in schools and I think four people raised their hand out of like 30 and like when we talk about Roe v. Wade and how like young people are kept out of these conversations like who is most likely to have unprotected sex and not have money or the capacity to get an abortion young high school people like those are people that are directly affected and yet they're kept out of these conversations literally they're not given proper sex ed at school like I like did I do sex like because education is more than an institution right so I do sex at every year and like you would not believe the things that students believe to be true and like I don't know if I could say the three holes thing but you would not Wait, believe no, that. That's, 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 that's oh okay sure so I mean one thing that my students learned was that you know women have not women but like people who can have periods have three holes like they have three holes. They have the pee pee hole, the poopy hole, and the baby birthing hole. And like, they were like, even my like students who menstruated, like they were shocked to hear this. And I was like, you did not know this? And they're like, no. And like, at school, like it's basic rudimentary stuff. Like we could talk all about menstruation. Like, oh, this is how birth happens. But then like, it's all like, it's nothing is really grounded in anything tangible in practice like for example I brought in a pad I brought in an IUD I brought in my own menstrual cup that I boiled and sanitized and some discs and a tampon and I passed I was like here touch it put it on the wall like feel free to try it out like I have free pregnancy tests and everything available to you and it's like the education the things that students are being taught in their schools versus what is actually happening in real life there's such a disconnect and it's like we have to bridge that and like we have to make it known and we have to make it happen essentially like we can't just keep people in like the bubble of school where they don't know people have three holes like that's just it's ridiculous like come on like people will be like oh yeah I know what a penis is I know what a vagina is I'm like oh yeah yeah you, you think you think you know because your school taught you one I had a student that said like oh yeah girls bleed from their ovaries for like a week right and I was like aren't you 17 <laughs> and it was just like gosh like how on earth can we expect our young people to be engaged and to be leaders if they don't know the issues that they're like even how can we talk about Roe v. Wade if you don't know how reproduction works like you can't they don't even know their own bodies literally exactly. you can't do that like it's so ridiculous gosh man I'm so so thankful that you're there to teach them the yeah, right it's, it's such a thrill when I have a high schooler <laughs> asking me about their vagina like I have to you know it's not horrible I love doing it to be honest but sometimes I have to put a straight face on be like you put a tampon on you won't lose your virginity like and it's like and you know I don't teach I don't I think also like sex that is not just like a reproductive thing it's also a pleasure thing it's also like mm -hmm. so cis and so straight and I try to deviate from that as much as possible I'm like yeah guys guess what two people of the same gender can have sex with each other <sighs> mind-blowing isn't it huh and they're pretend there's safe sex for that too guys like that's all the thing and it's like we just got to cram it into these people. Like we want to learn real things. It's just come on. <laughs> For sure. Real things. I like, can't I it's even harder in your States. Cause I'm in New York city. Like gosh, Texas is. Texas so, Virginia. I, I grew up in Louisiana. We never had any sex ed courses. We had the complete opposite. We had abstinence courses. Oh, <laughs> oh, trying to dissuade you from even having sex. It was like the dare version for sex. And I'm like, why are you like, and then later on in middle or high school, I'm like, why would you be surprised? There's so many teen pregnancies. People have no freaking, I like, number one, you made this actually even more mysterious than it should be. So you're enticing them to do it without even knowing how to protect themselves when doing it. Why are you surprised there are teen pregnancies? Like you're creating the problem in the first place. So um, yeah, we never, we didn't go that far. So yeah, let's talk about equity. <laughs> I was like, where equity. are we? Yeah, I guess we, we start talking about coochies and then. And then <laughs> like, I want to I want to talk a bit more about Dahir. You mentioned about how like education is not just within the walls of a school, but it could be more. Oh, for sure. I think 
I think education, when people think of education, they just think of K through 12 college and grad school and getting a PhD and like, blah, 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 blah. and I think education is so much like we have to change our views on what education means. Like education is so much more holistic. Like, you don't like what you're learning in school? Like, come, come to me, Kwan, join me. <laughs> I'll teach you about the world. But like, for real though, like education is so much more like it's our lived experiences. It's the stories that we hear. It's the things that we see with our own eyes and observe and the things that happen to us. And like books, like books exist. Like education has everything to do with understanding the world and understanding the workings about it rather than like having a degree or like getting this grade or that grade. Cause like, especially nowadays, like education of course under capitalism has just become so commodified and is like so much about just burning out, just pushing in as much. I mean, the school essentially is just replicating young people to be good little mm-hmm. workers. But in reality, and then they tend to push this quote unquote progressive message about like, hey, we want you to be social leaders and change the world, yo ha ha. When in reality, you're just pushing young people to just go out there and like suffer under capitalism. And I think if we're gonna change education, we have to change the way we view education. Education is so much more than degree. You don't have to go to college. You don't have to have X, Y degree. You don't have to feel like you're not good enough because you don't have, I don't know, you don't have like a freaking A minus in a clearly, I didn't go to just like freaking geometry, whatever. Like it's so much more than that. And the when we start viewing education from a holistic perspective and not from this capitalistic view of like producing good little worker bees I think is when we can really start implementing some change Mm because even like not just students but if we talk about teachers like the whole system of institutional education right now is so oppressive like teachers are blamed for students like failure teachers are essentially like blamed for all sorts of different things where like during the pandemic they were called like heroes and and then they were called lazy for not wanting to go back to school and then they're like like the emotional labor I used to be a teacher and like the emotional labor of being a teacher is like no joke because students confide in you because I love and care about them and I really think in order for us to change and create like a more accessible more responsive education we have to first change what the concept of education is in this country which means we have to burn down capitalism and we have (laughs) to yeah we just have to burn it down pretty much (laughs) as as well was what I really think to be honest with you like, gosh, I could go off about capital. That's great. <laughs> I'll bring the matches. However, <laughs> in Virginia. We're ready. I was like, uh, what about Virginia? So <laughs> I was like, how am I following that? <laughs> oh I guess like for us, like, I don't know, we do really need to see ourselves like in our history as well um like our community too like I feel like we don't really know much about like our community when we're in school we're just kind of like oh we do a community service thing and then like that's it you don't really learn about the people um like I know of like for here in Virginia the Eden Center um but like we can learn about that history of like you know the refugees from 75 going Um, coming here to Virginia and then settling down in Boston, um, Clarendon area, and then, you know, them kind of being gentrified out to the now Eden Center. Um, That I learned, like, separately on my own. And then, um, like, the city, actually, uh, I think, like, Arlington or something like that did, like, a walking history tour and, like, interviewed, like, people who, like, came here during that time. So we got to, like, hear more from them. Um, through that but like that wasn't taught in school and you know that is like right around the corner from us here in like northern Virginia um so yeah I was like that yeah like yeah he said history and I mean education goes beyond the classroom um it encompasses a lot more than just you know what we're just taught like Mm -hmm. we need to like emphasize on like the need to like learn more on like within our community ourselves and like you know, with others. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. Yeah. What about you, Stephen? Yeah, I think when we did our youth program, uh, we I like distinctly remember after the abortion rights uh, session, which shout out to Napoff, Texas for leading that one. All the students were like, we didn't know a lot of like, number one, what is possible now in a post uh, SB8, which was the bill that 
was enacted last year. And then around that time, also post row uh, world, like what we could use for abortion, because I think they, they mentioned medication abortion as an alternative that is still possible to get, but also how like, you know, there are terrible things like, um, I think they're called pregnant emergency pregnancy centers or something that disguise themselves as like, quote unquote, abortion places, but completely try to convince you to keep the baby at all costs. And they're funded by the state. They have like over hundreds of millions of dollars of funding to do this across the state. But yeah, the students were like, yeah, we didn't know this. We would not have learned this in school. But the fact that we showed up for this session, now we know and we can share with like the rest of our classmates. And I'm like, thank God, that is great. Um, So that was really cool as like seeing education outside the, the, the walls of a school, but also how like, I think, education is not tied to an age like no matter what age you are we're all I hope still trying to learn or learning things and like we're starting a senior civic engagement fellowship with like really cute senior Koreans in Houston and it's gonna be amazing and also we're gonna kick off by learning about our history because I don't think they know about that in like the context of America so I can't wait for those tears to come through and I can't wait (laughs) for those people to like share their own personal stories of how they relate to that grander history itself. And then I think the last thing in terms of like what we would like to do in education outside of the school is uh, we just, we just applied for funding to hopefully one day soon create a community garden in the Koreatown area. Of and like number one, you get to grow vegetables or fruits with other people in the same neighborhoods, that's a skill that you have to learn together. Imagine those conversations with other people in the area, because that part of town also has a lot of Latinx folks too. Imagine those conversations and what we could build together through that. So that to me is like also part of education and community building. So that's something we're really stoked about. But I guess in terms, like we're saying all this stuff, like why do we think Asians should care? Why should Asians care about quality education for everyone? Hmm. I'm gonna take a second to think. Education is so integrated into everything. I think people, I think a big thing we need to recognize that everything is intersectional and like education doesn't just mean learning. Education is tied to, again, capitalism. Education is again, tied to history. Education is tied, education is tied to housing because you, knowledge is power. If you don't know, you can't change. Like, and in addition to that, like education leads to organizing and is a means of organizing because when we educate each other, when we teach each other, when we hold space for each other's and when we are honest and open and inclusive about everybody, it only allows for more in, it only allows for a broader band of inclusive, it's inclusivity a lot, but inclusivity for everybody. And that also, like, if we don't just focus on like education in a capitalistic sense, like it becomes so much more accessible to people, like whatever barriers that would be like transportation, like literally school is expensive, like feeling ages, like feeling like you don't have community there. Like, I think Asians should specifically care about school because like, Education is a means of organization, of liberation, and it's about time we break through the, like, we break the the cycle of, like, using education as a means of survival. Like, yeah, education will fund, like, will further us all, it'll help us, but, like, not so we can get a job and make a million dollars and contribute to capitalism, but so we can make society a better place. Like, education at the base of it is, like, the fundamentals of society, like, so you should care because you care about society, right? Like, man, geez, like you care, you like you can you cannot speak about like community change and exclude education and exclude all of these things. Like it is at the base of everything, man. That's why Asians should care, in my opinion. That was a great PSA. Um, <laughs> I can add a little bit because I feel like you covered everything that I was thinking. <laughs> Do. but um in terms of yeah why why i think asians should care about education i i think on the note of like it helps create organizing it helps create community building with people who are not asian and i look at history as like one of the well when history is taught correctly and, and appropriately and 
not with lies as the way of getting there. So I, I look at like my own past. I didn't know, right, that, so my parents immigrated here in the late eighties. I didn't know for the longest time that they weren't allowed to before 1965. So when I like learned about that, you know, the, the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965 passing that stopped all those like racist bars in the US for migration, I, I was like, oh, so if that never happened, my parents would have never come here. Okay, interesting. And then I learned that was on the heels of the civil rights movement led by Black advocates and activists. And I was like, oh, so this really shows how our liberation is really connected <laughs> together. And I was like, oh, maybe this could be like a way of telling my parents of why they should be more in community with just not Asian people, but other folks too. And I feel like if you teach that in schools for like young folks, I hope they can see that like there's a shared future together. It's not just like my own block of people and your own block of people. We're separate, we're competing because of capitalism. But like, no, if we work together, we can get a lot of shit, good shit done together. Um, so that's, that's what I... Uh, that's why I feel like Asians should should care about this education. Yeah, what they said. <laughs> basically, <laughs> how am I following up with that, y'all? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, basically, an echo of Tali and Stephen. Um, that is why we should care. It's not just because we're Asian Americans, um, but you know, everyone should have access. Everyone, meaning regardless of their race ethnicity, gender, sexuality, ability, whether they're from working class families or non-English speaking families, um, regardless of their immigration status, everyone should have a high quality education and everyone should be supported and acknowledged um, in, you know, a place of learning and beyond that, um, just throughout um, our community and, you know, wherever we live. Um, so yeah, that's why Asian should care and everyone should care <laughs> about this topic. When you were listening all the like, regardless of like, go pop off, I'll keep going. <laughs> pop <laughs> all of them. Going for hours, like, we could really, we could go off, like, uh, <laughs> I could, like, I don't think people... Like, people love to be like, education is the great equalizer. Education will bring liberation for us all. Whose voice is this? Whose voice is this? I'm so good. <laughs> this is every white professor that I've had that loves to talk about their experiences of educating underprivileged children in these inner city schools. And then I'm like, okay, nice white savior complex showing there. Woohoo. And it's like, ugh, like, that's where I've developed, like, every white professor I've had that loves to talk about, like, Gosh, and I think people also need to realize, like, like I think specifically, like, undocumented people cannot get certified to teach in New York City Department of Education right now because you have to get fingerprinted, and uh -huh. you can't get fingerprinted if you're undocumented. And so, even with people who want to teach, who want access to, you know, educating the masses, like, we need to make access to those things more accessible. Like, I have so many friends who are wonderful teachers and who have lots of experience teaching young people, and yet they can't get certified by a state to work in a school simply because of their immigration status. Like, that's, that's just some silly dilly information. And in addition to that, like, my undocumented students, like, a lot of them feel very unmotivated to care about their education, of course, and education in school, because it's like, as an undocumented person, like there are so many limitations that you face. And it's like, again, this is why we need to look at education, not from an institutionalized capitalistic perspective, but look at it as a holistic experience that we could share with our community members. And like, it allows for a lot of intergenerational community building too. Like we have a lot of like our progressive, like first gen immigrants here that like would love to work with the students. And then the students could also then do like, know your rights sessions. Like there's just so much mm -hmm. opportunity that like, this country is just not looking at and is instead doing stupid shit with like I don't know how else to say it like gosh just don't be an asshole like is it like is it so bad guys come on they're just all really silly <laughs> yeah I think silly is the one of my students started saying that she was like white people are so silly <laughs> and I think since then <laughs> I've just been doing it she's like they're just silly I know she's going to watch this video and she's going to know that I am. <laughs> Hi, student A. Sorry. Anyway, well, thank you everybody so much for 
watching and listening and hopefully engaging and using your brains and thinking critically. Fight the power, y'all. And thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, click, <laughs> click here to subscribe. Click here to get notifications and ring the bell so you know when we upload videos. Comment below your favorite part. And yeah, thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. Fight the power.